Hi, I'm Derek Ashong, and you are now in the stream. Today, land evictions in Cambodia and how a proposed law can endanger NGOs working to protect property rights. And 30 mosques in 30 states. We look at the Ramadan journey of two men and their quest to highlight diversity in Muslim America. Our digital producer, Ahmed Shihab el Dean is here looking out for your live feedback. Tweet him at AJ Stream. Also on the couch is Max Blumenthal, a journalist and fellow at the Nation Institute. Max, you're very well known for your work on the rise of the radical right, your book about that in the U.S. Republican Party. But you recently come back from the Middle East. Tell us some of what you saw. Yeah, and you can tell I'm a little jet lagged still. I just recently got back. I was in Lebanon, which is you know, Syria consider, considers its backyard, so through osmosis I was able to gauge the situation of the uprising in Syria and the stability of the Assad regime. I spent a lot of time in Palestinian refugee camps and uh, started to understand their situation there, how, Lebanese, how the Lebanese government and society is systematically discriminated against them. And then, um, via Jordan, I went into Israel-Palestine and uh, I was really curious about the uh, July 14th tent protests mm -hmm. in Tel Aviv and elsewhere in Israel um, to understand what the demands of the protesters were about and why they've managed to avoid uh, discussing the most severe symptom of Israel's crisis, which is the occupation. That is a fascinating uh, experience and the fact that you brought up this issue. And we're actually yeah. going to be talking about some issues related to Israel-Palestine in the post show. So we're really glad that you could join us today. Yeah, great to be here with you. Awesome. Remember, you can tell us what stories matter to you as well. Follow us on Twitter and tweet your story idea using the hashtag AJStream. We might feature your suggestion in a future episode. Well, I'm Asit Tunç. I'm a professor of media at Istanbul Bilgi University, Istanbul, Turkey. I'm, I am on the stream. Land evictions have long been a serious issue in Cambodia. And as the country strives to expand and build, many of its own citizens are being displaced by construction and development projects. If you take a look at this image on my screen, people who live and rely on Cambodia's Prelong Forest have begun speaking out against their evictions, which were ordered to make way for plantations and other developments. We've actually got some images, some video from one of these protests that I'd love to show it with you. Uh, this is actually taking place and the image actually in Cambodia, and the, if you look at this, the face paint and the kind of colorful clothing that they're wearing is taken from uh, references to the movie Avatar, which basically tells a story of a group of forest people who are threatened by outsiders who are seeking to exploit their land for natural resources. What's more, the Cambodian government is currently on track to pass an NGO law, which critics say would limit the work of civil society groups that help protect citizens from being forcibly moved from their homes. Now, this NGO law has not passed yet, but the government already seems to be sending a message to groups that are supporting land rights protesters. Warnings have been issued, and one civil society group has actually been suspended for five months. Joining us now to discuss this via Skype from Phnom Penh is Virak O, oh, who's president of the Cambodian Center for Human Rights. His group has served as a voice for protesters working to keep their land in the Prey Long Forest. Virak, welcome to the stream. Thanks for joining us. Thank, thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be, to be here. It's a pleasure. Now, tell us a little bit about why the government is pushing this particular law and at this time. Well, there's, there's a lot of reasons. I think, um, I think the government, the ruling party, has effectively uh, silenced the opposition. Um, and I think the only remaining voice is the many uh, and vibrant civil society uh, working in, in, in Cambodia. And many of us uh, are watchdogs, um, our advocacy organizations, uh, trying to give voices to the most vulnerable of, of the country. Um, in the case, and in many instances, I think land evictions um, recently led to mass, mass uh, displacement of uh, hundreds of thousands of people. And it's, it's, be, it's becoming a major human rights issue. Uh, many, of, uh, many NGOs working in promoting and protecting human rights, are trying to empower commu uh, communities uh, so they have a voice, so they can defend uh, their own land. Now, I want to actually show you a video that shows some of what's happening with regard, because we can speak academically about people being evicted, but this is a very compelling image 
of what's physically happening on the ground. And then I have a question for you. Just take a look. Imagine watching bulldozers destroy your home, losing everything you own in an instant. Imagine being forced to move to a remote area with no jobs, no hospitals, and no schools, without clean water, adequate food, or sanitary living conditions. The fabric of your community destroyed. In less than a decade, forced evictions have become a reality to over a quarter million Cambodians. Now, they're talking about forced evictions becoming a reality for more than 250,000 uh, Cambodians over the last 10 years or so. This video is actually created by the Cambodian League for Promotion and Defense of Human Rights. Talk to us about the situation with land rights for Cambodians and are any, have the protests worked? Are any people getting their land back? Let, let, us, let me try to give you a picture. Uh, in just um, this past uh, four years, uh, my own organization documented uh, 223 cases of, of land uh, what we consider to be uh, land grabbings or uh, eviction. And in these 223 cases, we, we know that there, there are more uh, such uh, land grabbing cases. Um, and 223 is, is a, the number we can confirm. Uh, that, uh, that number affected 5% of the total land areas. And also, it, it affects um, almost a million uh, people. So if you look at, at that number, um, and these number we put, we we have the display, we're displaying them on online now on, on a website called city.org, s i t h i dot org. Um, it, the, the magnitude of this is affecting, uh, as I said, um, almost a million people. But also, I mean, these are real lives, real people who who's um, you know been crying, uh, whose whose basically livelihood has been completely uh, damaged or completely uh, destroyed. And many of these people are now. Uh, willing to speak out, willing to defend their own um, property, trying to defend uh, their livelihoods. And I think because of that, I think NGOs like ours uh, and, and many others are now being targeted by the government. And one of which is, is now the government is intended uh, to pass this NGO law. And it, the government itself has clearly stated um, that they do want to control uh, NGOs and particularly let me, and, and let me ask you a question to, to advocacy NGOs like let, ours. let me ask you a question Virak because the government is stating that they are actually working to help the country's development to continue some have said that the rate of growth in Cambodia is exemplary for the region and they believe that they can do more for the people if they have access to uh, this land for a variety of reasons how do you respond well the, the, sim the simplest uh, response is is the, whether the government taking into account the uh, the negatively the negative impact of all of these uh, development projects, and I think uh, no doubt I think all of us want the country to develop. Uh, we, we want um, economic development. We want these economic booms, but we at the same time uh, we cannot leave the most vulnerable behind. We cannot destroy livelihoods. We cannot destroy families. Um, and, and then removing from the, from removing them from school, from health facilities, and, and taking them uh, to a place where where they can no longer make a living. And, and I think that's the, the the message we're trying to uh, be uh, trying to send to the government. And that is develop, but making they have to make sure sure that they have to protect the rights of the people. They have to protect uh, people's property. They have to pe protect people's uh, livelihood. And at the very least, uh, if they need to evict people they have to do so by giving them fair compensation and ensuring that these relocations are equipped with health facilities with um, with school uh, and and ensuring that these people can make a living let's get some of online community involved yeah virak we have a tweet from dj Cree saying cambodia is a beautiful place with beautiful people but i'm not sure about those people pimping it in four wheel drive lexuses getting around so perhaps he's talking about wealth inequality but i wanted to ask you the World Bank stopped, uh, you know, they stopped loans that they were giving to the government, saying that the government failed to curb the evictions for, uh, that were earmarked for luxury housing. So in the grand scheme of things, isn't this policy hurting the government in the long run? Well, I, I think in, in the long run, if, if the world is paying attention and, and is willing to take a stand, uh, I think eventually it will hurt the government. And that the, the message to the government 
uh, from uh, people like us is, is look, we, we do want the country to develop, but if, if we're going to evict thousands and thousands of, of people away uh, from Phnom Penh and, and taking to a place where they cannot survive, then we're going to fight it. And now it's, it's not just the NGOs, the community themselves are standing up. And the case well, talk of, to us um, on that this, front of the people themselves we're, standing we're up. To, talk to us about the Prey Long. What's happening in the Prey Long forest? Well, this this prey long, um, prey long is a huge, is is a the biggest uh, evergreen forest in Cambodia. It's also the biggest in in the Indo Indo China uh, Peninsula. Um, it it um, cover an area of about um, uh, three thousand square kilometer. And if if you look at it, there's there's about twenty or so uh, indigenous plants that are in in danger. Um, uh, plant species, uh, there's about 27 endangered um, animals uh, species, and, and, and about 200,000 people depend on prey long uh, for, their tim for timbers, for uh, rattans, for, uh, you know, for, for their livelihoods. And, and then now uh, the government is giving land concessions or, or forest concession of, of prey long, uh, some part of prey long, uh, to uh, Vietnamese own company. And, and basically, this company is now uh, clearing the forest, and, and thousands and thousands of people are affected, and hundreds of them has been uh, taken to the street. And as, as you mentioned in the video, uh, they, they dress in this uh, avatar. They're trying to do all they, they can to uh, bring the attention to this uh, pristine forest. I have uh, two questions. Uh... My first question is, is there any group that is being disproportionately affected by the government's campaign? Because usually it's the rural poor who are affected first. And my second question is because uh, there's this avatar, um, this theatrical protest invoking avatar reminds me of a protest in the Palestinian village of Berlin where people dressed up as the, um, the what are the, the Navi from yeah, uh, the this, that they sort of pioneered this uh, style of protest in Berlin against the Israeli separation wall and against demolitions in their own village. So the Palestinian civil society has orchestrated a boycott of the U.S. supplied construction equipment, um, which is demolishing their villages and their homes. 11,000 homes have been demolished in Palestine since 2000. I wonder if you've identified the companies who are supplying this equipment to be used for this campaign. Well, the, the first uh, question, whether the, the um, rural poor are um, negatively affected, um, and the answer is no. Um, it, it's now coming to a point where it used to be the rural poor, the most vulnerable. Now, even this, uh, the the urban poor, the um, in the in the case where the World Bank is involved, uh, four thousand families are affected, and they 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 are um, ranging from from being urban poor to urban middle class uh, people, and 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 now you see this government is getting um, greedier, and and that is. Uh, now leading to uh, bigger and more uh, evictions. In terms of this creative um, uh, campaign, and I think um, it's, it's fair to say that NGOs are involved in empowering communities and giving community voice, like just like ours, we, we organize public forums where people can uh, speak up. But uh, but I think uh, the creativity, you know, we I have to give credit. Uh, to the the people themselves, um, these people are brave, um, very courageous. And they they are creative, and they uh, they are now willing to uh, do what they can uh, to to make sure that uh, their voice will be heard, and and this forest that they depend on uh, will be protected. Virak, thank you so much for joining us in the stream. We appreciate it. Thank uh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Remember, you can learn more about this story in Cambodia on our website, stream.aljazeera.com, where you'll find additional photos, videos, and lots more. Ethnic and racial divisions in Malaysia are a hot topic within the country, but because Malaysia's official media is state-run, much of the debate is occurring on social media and the country's vibrant blogosphere. Now, on August 4th, the Selangor Islamic Religious Department, also known as the JAIS, raided a Christian charity dinner in Malaysia. It seems JAIS had received reports that the Christian group was attempting to proselytize Muslims. Now, although the facts about what happened are coming out, this event, combined with recent calls for Muslim unity, have minority groups in the country concerned. And this tweet right here from Alan Nader 
says uh, it's a link actually to a WikiLeaks cable from the U.S. Embassy in Malaysia. And on that, uh, in that cable, it says, the increasingly strong Islamic identity of the dominant Malay population is causing an increase in race-based politics. Now, for more than two years, Prime Minister Najib Reza has been promoting a campaign called One Malaysia. Now, right here, you can see this is the website of One Malaysia. Now, uh, you know, this website is essentially something that is a point of controversy because the Prime Minister's critics argue that nothing is being done to actually realize his goal. So they accuse the government of playing politics and dividing Malaysians along ethnic and religious lines. So we're going to delve into all of this on Thursday's show, and we're looking for your input. So if you're in Malaysia, we want to hear from you. What do you think is causing the increase in uh, racial tensions in the country, and is the government to blame? So share your views with us on Twitter using the hashtag AJStream, or record a video, upload it to YouTube, and share the link with us, and we might play your comments on our show. Now here are a few other hashtags that we're following on Twitter. mosques in 30 states. That is what two Muslim Americans are aiming to see as part of their 13,000 mile road trip across the United States during the month of Ramadan. From Amity Muslims in Missouri to a Muslim village in rural South Carolina, the duo has been blogging about their adventures and the people they meet while showing the different faces of Muslim America that many people, especially non-Muslims, may not associate with Islam. Let's take a look at this video which shows a sing-along event that took place in Atlanta on day 17 of their journey. Which will you deny? Now Allah is one. He has no partners or sons, and his power controls all things. He fashioned the universe, causes the child's birth of his favors, which will you deny? See it with me. Which of the favors who will you deny? Great are the favors of your Lord. Which of the favors of your Lord will you deny? Blessed are the favors. Blessed are the favors. Blessed are the favors of the Lord. Joining us now to discuss this via Skype from Delaware is writer and comedian Aman Ali, who makes up half of the team behind 30 Mosques in 30 States. He blogs at 30mosques.com with writer and filmmaker Bassam Tariq. Aman, welcome to the stream. Thanks for having me. What gave you guys the idea to take this trip? Well, it was a very impulsive idea. It started in 2009. Uh, my friend Bassam and I live in New York, and we decided in 2009 it wouldn't be crazy if we went to 30 mosques in 30 days around New York. And so we set up a blog just focusing on the mosques in New York. And then last year we decided, you know what, we had a great time in New York, but our experience you know, wasn't exclusive to New York. There's all these cool communities around the country to check out. And so we hopped in a rental car and we hit the road. And we realized at the end of last year's trip that there's so much more in this country that needs to be explored. And that's why this year we're continuing that. So in the span of two years, We'll have covered all 50 states uh, in this country and then some. Wow. And is it your goal to educate people? Are you trying to educate non-Muslims? Are you trying to educate the Muslim community? What, what is the purpose of the blog and the whole adventure? You know, we're storytellers at heart. We're not really activists. We're not trying to change people's perceptions. We're more concerned about uh, telling authentic stories about the Muslim community, about the people where they come from, why they believe what they believe. And that's really what we're trying to do. If we educate someone about Islam, if they learn something positive, that's great. If they learn something negative, if we just reinforce stereotypes, hey, that's fine by us as well. It's a democracy. People are entitled to their opinion. We're just well, more concerned. Are we telling authentic stories? Well, speaking of people's opinions, you've received some criticism uh, because of your actual shooting in the women's section of a mosque. I mean, do you feel like there's a substantive critique there? 
Well, it was funny because the substantive critique before we visited that mosque was, hey, you're two guys going on this road trip. You know, your experience is going to be very different than women. You know, why aren't you talking to the women? And so what was frustrating about that was, well, okay, we went to the mosque. We tried to hang out with the women. We actually got permission from the mosque to do it. And it was the women themselves that wouldn't let us talk to them. So it's like, look, here we are trying so hard to talk about women. And it's the women themselves in this particular case that weren't letting us do that. But I think we talked about, we did a good job of the way we handled it. We were respectful. If women didn't want to speak with us, that was completely fine. Uh, and we talked about our perspective as men is very limited um, to, to the uh, female voices in the community. And so, but it was great that it created conversation. Women came forward and said, you know what? I go to the mosque and I'm very frustrated. I can't hear it because it's so noisy. There's no space for me. So... It was a heated discussion, but it was a very substantive discussion. I'm glad that people are still talking about it. That's amazing. I mean, you guys have done a really powerful thing in the sense that you've inspired others. We saw this website called Pink Mosque that is coming out of Indonesia, and they're actually responding to what you said. A woman said, you know, I just read an interesting story about women's space in mosque from 30mosque.com. Pink Mosque has been blogging from the women's point of view, so this is going to be their response to what you guys have seen. Uh, we've got a lot of comments from our community as well on this. Yeah, you know, Lukman Ahmad, uh, who is an Ahmadi Muslim, said he's very proud of, you know, 30 mosques for visiting an Ahmadiyya Muslim mosque on your trip. He says it's a lesson for Pakistan and Indonesia. So, obviously, this is an unconventional trip. Aside from the obvious criticisms, I mean, what was your objective, per se, by going to this Ahmadiyya mosque? So, for those who aren't familiar with the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, and uh, uh, Ahmadiyya is obviously no better than I do, but they believe that um, there was another prophet after uh, Muhammad. And, you know, I personally disagree with that, but the fact of the matter is the Ahmadiyyas in the United States came to the U.S. in the early 1900s and helped spread Islam throughout the U.S. And so getting the mainstream public aware with Islam uh, was credited, should be credited to the Ahmadiyyas. And so I was, my, the point I was trying to make was, well, there's so much that we are, should be thankful for, you know, for getting mainstream acceptance of us, thanks to the Ahmadiyya community. So it was basically to create that sense of conversation. You know, it wasn't trying to debate or point, counterpoint and argue or anything like that, but it was just trying to learn about who this community is and, you know, there's so much that we can benefit from one another. And I was just there basically to create a conversation. Max, your thoughts? Yeah, well, I've done a lot of work on uh, the rise of Islamophobia in the States. And uh, since... Uh, the assassination of Osama bin Laden, uh, anti-Muslim sentiment is, a, is at a record high in the U.S. A recent poll from, uh, I think, Ohio State University showed that even 24 percent of registered Democrats see Muslims as an internal threat to the United States. 20 percent of Americans don't want to be friends with Muslims. For me, and what I see in your video, it rings, it, it rings true to me because I grew up in Washington, D.C. African Americans comprise the majority of Orthodox Muslims in the U.S., so I was around that community. It seems distinctively American to me, but I wonder if in your travels and in your conversations with Muslims, there was a sense um, that they were besieged or being discriminated against or that they are um, able, able to comfortably assimilate once they get to know the people in their communities. And, you know, you, make, you raise some very interesting points. And, you know, there's no doubt that there are these individual cases of Muslim backlash or Islamophobia or whatever you want to call it in this country. But to say that this sentiment is remotely reflective of average ordinary Americans is ridiculous because it's interesting. You look at the study and it says that a certain percentage of people have a, a favor, uh, an unfavorable view of Muslims or Islams, but I bet half of them don't even know that some of their best friends are Muslims or, right. you know, who is a Muslim? What does a Muslim look like? So maybe on a, on a survey they say, okay, I don't like Islam. I don't like this. I'm, I'm, I feel very, I don't feel comfortable about that, but they might not know that their doctor is Muslim, that uh, their banker is Muslim or one of their classmates is Muslim. You right. know, we don't go around with, there's no specific profile for Muslims. So it's weird. You, mean you don't, you don't you have name tags? <laughs> I'm going to, right? exactly. Right. I'm going to stop you just there and we're going to come right back to you on this subject. Thank you, Oman, for being with us. We're going to continue the conversation in our post show. Thank you, Max, for being with us. And we'd ask you to stay with us as well. Join us at stream.aljazeera.com. We're going to be diving deeper into this, learning about a Native American who converted to Islam and also about an Islamic village in the Carolinas. Stay with us.
Welcome back to The Post Show. You are live with us here in the stream, and we're talking about the 30 Mosques in 30 Days project that is being run by two young uh, Muslim Americans, and it's got some really interesting aspects to it. I want to go back to Aman. Listen, there was a, I was really struck by a couple of things that you saw, namely the ways in which people, uh, the Muslim American community is much more diverse than people expect. So talk to us about two things. First, I want to ask you about what Max brought up, the African-American Islamic community, and tell us about Islamville, the place you visited in South Carolina. Yeah, in South Carolina, there's a, a town called Islamville. There's actually similar towns around the country. There's a Slomberg in, in New York and some other parts of the country as well. And it's a group of predominantly African-American Muslims that have kind of created this own little sustainable Muslim town, for lack of a better phrase. And there's a mayor in town, there's a city council, and it's a fully functional city. And, uh, you know, one, their, their reasoning is, well, we need to, you know, instill this sense of Muslim values into our children. So we need to create a sustainable community in order to do that. Other people could look at that and say, well, yes, but you shouldn't isolate yourself from, you know, the mainstream and cut yourself off. So there's different ways to look at it. But you have to respect the fact that there is this vision. There is this grand plan to kind of create something like this. And they were very warm and friendly to us when we, you know, hung out with them. Uh, you know, we're, we... We didn't contact them in advance. We found out at the last minute. We just kind of just rolled in there, yeah. and they were very friendly towards us, and we had a really good time. And it was weird well, we've because... actually got some images. I've got some on my screen and Ahmed sure. on his that we can show that are talking about uh, this same issue. But please go on. Yeah, so they're, 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 they're African-American, but what's interesting is they follow a scholar that is uh, Pakistani. And so because of his influence, they all can speak like fluent Urdu. They have wow. even like I'm South Asian, so they even have like South Asian mannerisms. Like you know, they talk with their the way they talk with their hands, or they even like bobble their head a little bit, uh -huh. and they even have like the little like uncle bellies, and they, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, dude, this is amazing. Like, how no, did this happen? You know and, what's like, so funny? But just before you go, yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned that because you were showing a picture of the man, and yeah. I was like, he's got that uncle belly. Yeah, he looks yeah. just yeah. like my uncle. <laughs> all uncles are the same. Is the moral of the story? <laughs> no doubt. One quick question: um, We saw that one of the comments by Gator Gal. Uh, on the Arkansas mosque was that segregated mosques are only a product of American hypersensitivity. This talks about how in Muslim countries men and women pray together. Uh, so I don't know if you read that comment, but what, what would you say is your experience as a, as a Muslim American? You know, it, it's hard to, to say that, you know, this is the model for how mosques should be and all mosques should be segregated or all mosques should be all inclusive all together. It's really based on the community themselves and the relationships they have with one another. And it's so hard to kind of paint the Muslim community with like a monolithic brush. So what works in Arkansas, you know, might not work in a larger community in Chicago or New York, for example. So when I, I did read that comment yeah. and it's hard for me to kind of, you know, say that every community should be like this but what it what community should be is addressing the needs of the people and addressing the needs so if there is a space where women need more space or need to feel comfortable praying side by side with men you know those 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 needs should be addressed right so talk to us a little bit about bashir butcher i'm going to put a, a picture of him up in my screen he's from the sioux native american tribe in south dakota and in 2001 he converted to islam what's his story right and if you just look at the photos he's just visually just a beautiful man just a very distinctly like chiseled kind of guy and uh, he was he grew up Native American lived on a reservation and uh, you know Native, he believed in a lot of Native American philosophies of being one with the environment being connected to nature and being connected to human beings and when he started researching about Islam through one of his friends uh, he realized that Islam kind of preaches these principles as well and so it was an affirmation of his identity and so when he became Muslim it actually strengthened his identity as a Native American, not throw it away, because oftentimes when a problem in this country is where when non-Muslims embrace Islam, they're often told incorrectly by people, oh, you need to throw away your identity. You're no longer David. Your name is Dawood, or you need to grow a beard, or you need to dress a certain way. And Bashir felt, you know, strengthened as a Native American. And I think that's very important, because I think it's one of the biggest problems in the Muslim community is this idea of imposing someone's cultural interpretation on someone and telling them to throw away who they are and become someone else. That's amazing. Ahmed has got a great image of the two of you actually on his screen. Go and then ahead. I don't know if you want to get in here, but I just want to throw one tweet that came in from A. Poor Ahmed. He's saying, how about 30 mosques in 30 countries? Is that what's next? <laughs> you know, that's one of the ideas. Actually, we've been approached uh, about it, and a lot of people have pitched to us, and we've thought about it as well. Um, 
we'll do it, you know, if it makes sense. You know, we we don't want to make this a gimmick like every year 30, then the year after 30 planets and hang out with the Somalis. <laughs> the Somali community in Neptune, I'm sure, is like amazing. But like, you know, no we'll do it if it makes sense. If there is a desire and there is a hunger to learn more about communities around the country, you know, we'll evaluate that accordingly. Well, well, just quickly, because you said that, I'm going to have to get in here. Uh, Ali Saad Ibrahim said, and I think this might be an indication that there is a desire, um, the one story that he wants the media to talk about is blaming the Muslims always. So perhaps there is a need um, for that very thing you were describing. That's a good well, hashtag, blame the Muslims. Yeah, well, we did, we did, we did a story, that hashtag we did a on our story show. You... About that, actually. And, uh, and I, I've got one more question for you, Aman, sure. actually, before we let you go. You know, we're coming up on the 10th anniversary of September 11th. A lot of people are talking about it. How do you think relations, uh, or at least the acceptance of Muslim Americans, has been affected 10 years after that? Well, I think Muslims have done a great job responding to this tragedy and just similar attacks and saying that this is, has nothing to do with Islam. And people have learned that, you know, Islam is a peaceful religion. But I think we've only defined ourselves as victims and as people of backlash against hatred and things like that. And we haven't really shown people that we're just normal people just like anybody else like okay um we've told people that we're peaceful people but do they know that our god is the same god as christians and jews and have we told them that we accept their holy books and and things like that and we have very similar belief systems i don't think we've done enough of that and so with our project we're trying to show people that we're just like anybody else. You know, we believe in the same God. We pay taxes. Mm -hmm. We have crazy women trying to stalk us, you know, when we break up with them. And, you know, we have, you Speak know, crazy yourself. kids. That yeah, we that's just you, bro. <laughs> that's just you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's just me. <laughs> but, um, but you know what I'm saying? And so that's really yeah. what we're trying to do with this project. And so I think yeah. in a 9-11 context, we've only defined ourselves as that. And we're tr I'm mm. trying to break that mold and trying to show yeah. people that there's a lot more to us than just 9-11. Final question. What's next? What's next is taking a nap when this is all done. <laughs> um, it's to create more conversation, you know. I also work as a stand-up comic, and so this fall I'm going to be hitting the road talking about this experience and all the shenanigans we've gotten into and continue this going that just because Ramadan is over doesn't mean that these problems still aren't there. Yeah. And we want to keep this conversation going. Aman, thank you so much for being with us. You're doing something really amazing. Thank you. Thank you guys for having us. Take care. That is so fascinating. I love the joy that he brings to this project. And I can imagine how many people are getting their eyes open through right. the perspective that they're taking. I think it's really positive for the reasons I enumerated, the misperceptions about Muslims. But I think uh, it could also be problematic. Mm. Um, the idea of proving that Muslims are somehow normal within an American context. What is normal? I think uh, part of being American is being able to define yourself any way you want according to your own values and your own identity. So defining yourself as normal, meaning that you worship the same God as Christians, as the dominant majority, mm -hmm. is uh, somewhat problematic. And it's uh, sort of, it, to me, it reminds me of like over, overcompensation that a lot of immigrant groups find themselves in. Well, I, I mean, I can say for myself as an immigrant, you know, it's, it's kind of, I think you raise a good point, but it's almost like a par for the course. Because when people don't know who you are, you wind up being doing this job of educating them. And people ask my mother certain questions, like, where are you from? And she won't say anything. People ask me, what's your necklace about? And I'll give them the whole saga yeah. of my culture yeah. and identity. For Jews, it, it was the same when we came to this country. A lot of Jews who went into show business and broadcasting changed their last names. So one of the most, yeah. one of the most famous baseball broadcasters, Mel Allen, was really Mel Israel. Wow. wow. You know, well, I'm glad you brought up Israel, because I actually want to switch to that topic. You just came back from Israel. <laughs> Israel and Palestine, and we've been discussing this issue of, you know, some things that are going on in that region, and I want to kind of switch into that conversation, because we saw what happened with uh, Flagman just last week. We saw this idea that, uh, you know, people are protesting in Cairo about the shooting of policemen uh, across the border from Gaza, but we also see protests happening in Israel itself. So what, what do you, is your take on all of this? Well, with uh, Flagman and the protests in Egypt, I mean, Israel has repeatedly killed Egyptian security officers in the Sinai, and this is the first time they've felt any consequences for it, mm -hmm. which shows the effect of the Arab Spring on Israel. They're starting to feel it. Yeah. When Mubarak was there, he would have whitewashed the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Flagman is uh, sort of 
one of the kind of people that would have filled Tahrir Square, just the regular guy. He probably yeah. wasn't on Twitter. He climbed the uh, Israeli embassy in Cairo, uh, yeah. dozens of floors, ripped off the Israeli flag, and was uh, became an international star. Now, what this led to, yeah. which is amazing, which shows the power of social media and YouTube, is Netanyahu proclaiming in a cabinet meeting as he was trying to attack Gaza um, for a terror attack for which Gaza... Clear, doesn't have any clear responsibility. He, mm -hmm. he said, he told his ministers, Israel lacks the international legitimacy to escalate the operation. Yes. Which means because of the tensions with Egypt, we can't go in with ground troops. I don't yeah. know when they ever had the international legitimacy to decimate But, but basically Gaza, you're but, saying that people are having an impact. But the pressure of the Arab Spring is really being felt inside Israeli uh, power. You know, if I can um, try to just sum it all up in one way, on a personal note, my name is Ahmed, and for so many years after 9-11, I felt marginalized as a Muslim, as an Arab, and just having the name Ahmed, people didn't want to hear it. Yeah. And so to see Flagman, whose name is Ahmed, his yeah, first name yeah. is Ahmed, um, you know, made to be a hero and in the world's eyes to be seen as a hero on social media I think alone on a personal note is really uh, you know makes me feel kind of um, to be the word is proud yeah. that this con context and this culture can now sort of start to shift in the eyes of a lot of people in the world. Well you just raised a great point and for those who are watching that may not be aware of this Flagman was the number one trending right. topic yeah. in uh, over the weekend the world, and yeah. I think this is a, a really good idea or at least the concept that you know, people are starting to define themselves. And I think this is evident in the Arab world, but it's happening globally. And I think it's a trend to watch. It's not about social media. It's not even about revolution. It's about having the power to dictate the life that you want to live. Yeah, and demonstrating that alliances with dictators aren't true alliances. If right. you want a real foreign policy, it has to be based on alliances with popular will and the yeah. people of another country. Well said. Max, thank you so much for being with us. We hope that you'll come back yeah, again. thanks for having me and on. And Ahmed, great job as well. And thanks for sharing your personal insights. I really love it. Uh, thank you for being with us too. Uh, join us, tweet us at AJStream. We'll be continuing our conversations online as always. We will see you there.